Hey, it's Alicia, and welcome back to another deep dive into nervous system patterns, otherwise known as our automated behaviors that dictate our unconscious thoughts, feelings, and behaviors or actions in life until we make them conscious. Today's topic is actually really where it all started for me because we're talking about when pain becomes a nervous system pattern. So first of all, did you even know that pain can become a nervous system pattern? I didn't either until one very special client of mine taught me about this in really great detail. Apparently, the term neuroscientist didn't even exist until about 10 years ago, which I find crazy. I heard Andrew Huberman, a neuroscientist, say this in an interview recently, and it kind of blew my mind because about 10 years ago is when I was exploring the idea of neural loops or the nervous system. And most of the time I talked about it back then as neural plasticity or neural loops. I had no idea that neuroscience as a field unto itself was actually just getting started. So when I began working full time with people in pain in 2012 in Boulder, Colorado, I was committed to every client and solving their pain. And I was determined to figure out what was at the root of, you know, whoever's pain was stepping in my office, even if what was causing their pain was maybe beyond my pay grade. <laughs> um, I realized from my own experience trying to get professional help for trauma, anxiety, gut issues, and knee pain without a whole lot of success, that healing and finding answers really wasn't about credentials or licensure. It was more about curiosity, gumption, and perseverance. So I wasn't about to let my clients down when I knew that I had really deep wells of curiosity, gumption, and probably more perseverance than was good for me. So I started researching this thing called neuroscience or neural loops. And back then, I think I talked about these things as myelination pathways, which is one of the you know terms that we can use. And all of these patterns I've been sharing with you in this series, they all started with my clients who are experiencing persistent physical pain and not getting results when I felt like they maybe should have. So I was wondering why were some of my clients getting immediate results while other clients' pains seemed to stubbornly persist despite our agreement together that they were doing everything right. Enter Desiree, one of my favorite client stories of all time and one of my favorite human beings. And she was also the case that helped me understand just how powerful our nervous systems can be for good or bad. I met Desiree in 2015 when she came to my office for an initial appointment after nearly giving up on her body's ability to heal. She was 37 at the time and had undergone hip replacement surgery about six months before finding me. And she had believed that the surgery would be the answers to years of prayer. When she was just 19, she got in a car accident and broke her hip. The doctors told her there was nothing they could do because she was too young to get a hip replacement surgery at that age. So they told her she'd have to live with the pain until she could get surgery. And being Desiree, she stubbornly persisted and created enough optimism and persistence to basically figure out how to do marathon running and became a wilderness therapy guide. And she just didn't want to let the pain define her life. But eventually the pain and the years of pushing through it caught up to her. She didn't walk for more than 10 minutes in the six years leading up to her surgery. So when she heard the news that she'd finally be able to get that hip replacement surgery, she believed it would be the answer for her. And she'd be able to start walking, biking, running, and hiking mountains again. She had the surgery, did the prescribed six months of physical therapy, did some talk therapy, hypnotherapy, acupuncture, and massage, and was no better off from a pain perspective than before the surgery. Imagine what that would feel like. Uh, the surgeon declared her surgery a success too. And the doctors and physical therapists told her she just had a case of hip bursitis that apparently six months of PT had not resolved. Hmm. So <laughs> when I heard this, I was like, hip bursitis in a metal joint? Interesting. So during our first session, I did what I always do. I mapped her lower body to find any imbalances left to right, front to back, in order to figure out what was causing her pain from an imbalance or muscle firing perspective. And I fully expected her right leg to be the tight one because it was her left hip 
that had been broken since age 19, and then of course underwent surgery. But in that first session, it was actually her left quad, quad hip flexor, IT band, and adductor that all appeared more adhesed or dense to me. And then in our second session, working together while I was on her right quad, something hit me and I was inspired to just blurt out, you've had to be really strong for a long time. Do you think you could let go now? Nothing really happened during the session and I didn't think too much of that question I had asked her, but the next time she stepped in my office, she practically ran into the room and asked me, is it normal, do you think, that I've been crying every day since I left last time? Whenever she tells the story now, she always says that she cried every day for six weeks after that second session. And what was really interesting to me is that after that, her right leg appeared tighter. So living with a broken hip required her to be really tough, to endure, to push through, and try to live her life. It also meant that her nervous system had memorized the hip pain along with the enduring, the pushing through, and the being strong. It had become her identity, actually, at a time when she was still neuroplastic. So I've never said this in any of the other nervous system pattern videos, but our brains and nervous systems are the most neuroplastic in childhood, and then kind of peter out at about age 25 when we stop being subconsciously neuroplastic. We can still change our brains after this, but we have to do it consciously. So Desiree worked with me every week for months, and her goal was to be able to hike after her wedding that summer. I kept telling her that I believed she could run and hike again, and she kept telling me to hold that belief for her until she was ready to believe it for herself. Desiree had to unlearn that hip pain at the nervous system level or the subconscious psychological level, but she also had to relearn some conscious beliefs about herself. She had literally memorized all that pain and all the ways she had had to cope with it from age 19 on. So it was really a process to undo not just the physical aspect, but the beliefs that were now so ingrained in her mind and her physiology. Beliefs like, I'm always going to be in pain. I have to learn to live with this pain. I have to be strong. I am strong. I won't let this pain stop me. Pain, pain, pain. That word pain was a mantra that she had repeated so often. It became her reality even after there was no more physiological cause for the pain. Now, thankfully, she is a very smart woman and a trained psychotherapist, so she knew how to let herself feel the emotions and release them from her body. I convinced her to go hiking with me about six weeks into working together, and she didn't believe that she could hike yet, and she was scared, but I knew she could. So I told her we'd go together, and if anything happened on the trail, I was not afraid to step on her on the dirt, in, on, on the trail, in the dirt, um, or on a rock, really just whatever it took. I was not going to let her down. I was not going to, you know, leave her up there in pain. We were going to make it work. So we hiked about 45 minutes that day before turning around, and she was elated with her 40 minutes total but I wasn't gonna let her off so easily. So a week later, I talked her into one of the toughest short hikes in Boulder, Colorado, Mount Sanitas, a rocky trail that gains about 1,343 feet of elevation in just a mile and a half. She kept telling me not to jinx her by saying we would make it to the top. She wanted me to say, let's wait and see. <laughs> but I couldn't help myself. I kept telling her, we're gonna make it. Approaching and then standing on that summit with her is one of my life highlights and a moment I will never forget. When she realized she was there at the top of a mountain, somewhere she hadn't been for over six years and really wasn't sure she would ever see again, she turned to me with these big teardrops just spilling from her eyes and asked me over and over, are you kidding me right now? Is this real? Are you for real? I'm standing on a mountain. This is my dream. Is this real? This is how you break a nervous system pattern. You find proof that you're not broken. You go do the thing you believe you can't do to pain. And when you do it, when you win, you celebrate with your whole being, your whole body, with a lot of emotion, like your dreams just came true. More often than not, we have to show ourselves that we can do something despite our nervous systems actually telling us to doubt, telling us to be careful, telling us to play it safe. 
in order to find out that we actually can do far more than we give ourselves credit for. Our bodies are more res resilient and adaptable than we think they are, but we really need to be resilient and adaptable in our consciousness too. The body can guide us or we can guide the body. And my preference is to do it both ways in partnership. So after that hike, Desiree started walking, biking, and hiking without any hip pain. I sent her to my trainer and kinetics practitioner, Jason, to get her glutes firing. She married her best friend, got pregnant, and had her baby without any hip pain or flare-ups, something she had been worried about before. Now, I believe the reason the PT had not worked for her is because they weren't addressing the underlying issues in her nervous system of holding on, of the identity of being a strong person every day and believing at the nervous system level that life is pain, that every day is a struggle to overcome or get through. Think about phantom limb pain for a second. The limb is gone, but the brain still thinks it's there and the person feels pain in a non-existent limb because that's how powerful our brains are and our nervous systems. You can go through a successful surgery and structurally be sound and still have pain if your brain continues perceiving the pain you walked into surgery with. Now, maybe you're wondering, were there physiological reasons Desiree was in pain? Sure, maybe. She definitely had fascial adhesions and imbalances and her left gluteus medius needed help firing. It was not activating after surgery. But you can have all of those things be true and actually not be in pain. Pain is the perception that we might be in danger, and her nervous system was the dominant factor here. By letting go and unleashing those tears of grief and relief that flowed out of her for six weeks, she could finally let her body be a whole body instead of a broken one. Sometimes we need to cry tears of relief in order to let go of our old identities that got us through hard times but now keep us stuck. Desiree could finally live instead of enduring each day and allowing herself to experience that change with her whole body and her whole being and all of her emotions made all the difference in the world. So if pain has become a nervous system pattern for you, it will be something your brain perceives despite possibly no evidence that there's anything wrong. But it's really important to be aware here that there's always something we can point to in the body that suggests our body is slightly defective or slightly unhealthy, right? Desiree was told she had hip bursitis, but did she really? And all that means to me is that someone's hip joint isn't getting enough blood flow. By my definition, that was probably true. <laughs> she had all these fascial ad ad adhesions, right? But conventional medicine would usually treat something like hip bursitis with a tissue numbing corrosive cortisone injection. Pain can be a nervous system pattern related to trauma, physical, emotional, or a combination. The primary sign or symptom is that you wake up each day expecting to feel pain specific to your history. And so you do. It could also be related to beliefs you have, maybe, maybe beliefs that were once very true, like Desiree, but aren't any longer. So in order to break these patterns, you'll need to figure out if the perception is due to physical injury and trauma or both. And often, one becomes the other until they're intimately commingled in the experience. Because pain, after all, can be traumatic or feel traumatic. Think about Desiree living with a broken hip at just 19 years old and spending her entire 20s enduring pain only to enter her 30s and not even be able to walk for more than 10 minutes until age 37. Then getting that surgery you think is going to save you, doing everything right and still being in pain. That's gotta feel traumatic. So if this is you or you think it is, here's how to break this pattern. Number one, the best way I know how to break these patterns when pain has become a nervous system pattern is, and I'm saying this from personal experience, breaking my own nervous system patterns of pain, is to get to know your body. Commit yourself to understanding what a human body is made of and how it functions. Make sense of your brain, your nervous system, and your fascia. When you seek to understand how you're designed physically, what you're actually built from, and how human beings thrive, you can begin to crack the code on your own pain. Number two, 
make sense of neuroscience for yourself. And you can do this at a pretty elementary level. You'll wanna figure out how pain actually happens at the nervous system level. So you can demystify this thing we call pain and stop feeling scared of it. Pain is the perception that we might be in danger. That's it. You have to figure out if your tissues are actually damaged or whether your nervous system is triggering that fire alarm or smoke alarm for other reasons like emotional or belief reasons. Number three, identify the primary nervous system patterns you've adopted that are keeping you stuck and replace them with new ones. You can do this using the series that I've been doing here and begin that investigation for yourself because I've really given you the primary patterns that I've seen working with thousands of people. Number four, if you come to the conclusion that you actually have tissue damage or some kind of real physical danger, like pelvic instability, glutes not firing, fascia that is so restricted, your joints aren't getting blood, leading to all the itises like arthritis and bursitis, then you know what to do. Release your fascia, find the imbalances, and get those muscles firing. Number five, on the other hand, if you come to the conclusion that your pain is due to perceiving danger because of a nervous system pattern related to or unrelated to physical or emotional trauma, then you may need to go on a journey of self-reclamation and train yourself how to perceive possibility instead of impossibility, aliveness instead of potential risk and danger. Those of us with nervous system patterns like this, and I count myself among this group, we have to begin to perceive that we are alive, that we are whole, that we are not broken, and that we can take risks and go on adventures, and we will be there to take care of our bodies when they need our help to perform well. But we really need to stop perceiving dangers that were only present either in childhood or in Desiree's case, after an accident, right? And are irrelevant now. And then at some point, if we are really ready to break this pattern, we have to believe these things I just mentioned with our whole being and have an emotional and physiological experience that rewires our nervous system perception of our own being and our own body. I had my moment of crying in awe and relief like Desiree in the summer of 2013 in the Tetons of Wyoming. She had that moment on the top of Mount Sinitas in Boulder, a hike that she once believed was impossible in order to completely reverse her patterns. Your moment will be unique to you, but you will find it in an activity that represents freedom and aliveness to you. I'm on a mission to get this information out there for those of you that are committed to your own freedom, to coming fully alive, to being fully human. So please share these nervous system videos and share your stories of changing your patterns. If you have a really great story, I would love it if you would actually email me at info at mobilitymastery.com and let me cheer you on and celebrate your evolution. Thank you so much for watching this and I will see you next time.